Okay, well, I'd just like to welcome everyone to, the, to, this, to this session. Um, so what Andy and Quiven are gonna cover today, as it says on the title, is good practice for transferring data. Uh, this is clearly a, always been an issue on, on national services where you have large amounts of data um, you know, in and around the computer and you might want to take it off somewhere else to your own local storage. But clearly it's gonna be an issue as well whenever there's a, a transition between services like there's between Archer and Archer 2. Um, but um, I know that uh, Quiven has revisited some, some work we did a while back on the best ways to take data on and off Archer. And um, this is just a review, I think, uh, covering those, um, giving tips and hints for doing this the best way. So I'll shut up now and pass over to Andy. Thanks, David. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit, as David said, about transferring data. Um, from Archer and the off Archer and the RDF, and um, there's a few general hints in here about uh, data management that I'll mention as, going, as I'm going through. Um, actually, what I should say is all of the work to update the guide has done been done by Quiven, who is um, sat next to me here, though you can't see him at the moment. Um, Quiven's going to be keeping an eye on the chat window in case people ask questions there, and is going to sort of alert me to them or if there's just simple ones, he'll try. If there's simply and it doesn't mean we should interrupt the flow of the webinar, he'll probably just try and answer them in the chat window there. So um, without without further ado, we'll get on with the webinar. What I've tried to do is keep it quite short to give people a chance to ask questions. Um, so please do interrupt me if things don't make sense or if you have questions um, about anything as we go along. So uh, the first few slides, so actually the first slides create a common slide that says you can use the material from here um, however you want to make things to um, you can use the material to create your own presentations um, this material is being recorded and all these slides and the recording will go up on the Archer website um, after we've finished uh, the webinar um, so first of all some useful links so the, the, one of the reasons we're doing this webinar is we recently or even recently updated the data management guide on the Archer website um, so the information in this web, or all the information in this webinar comes from there. Uh, so you can always go and look there um, for information in a bit more detail as well. Um, there's the user guide, which discusses the different Archer file systems, what they can be used for, uh, what the limitations and um, what the challenges of the different file systems are. And um, there's also Globus Online, and I won't go through that too much now, but we'll talk about it in a little bit more detail um, later on in the webinar. So what I thought I'd do is just give you the spoilers. So if you don't want to stick around for the rest of the webinar, um, this is the sort of high level take home messages is that if you're transferring data, the best things to do are if you've got lots of small files, convert them into a single larger archive file before transferring because the overhead of starting up a transfer for each file is quite large. So if you have lots of little files, that's going to slow you down um, a lot. Use the right tool for your transfer. A lot of people use rsync. But actually this adds, adds, can add a lot of overhead and is only should only really be used if you're transferring data and be updating that data continuously from the copy that's on Archer on the RDF to the remote copy. Otherwise, you're just adding overhead um, of checking whether files have changed or not for no good reason um, at all. Um, if you're going to the complication of using something like Globus Online, which is a bit, quite a bit more complicated to use because you think you need the performance of um, parallel for your large data, you should check they actually really need it and can actually really exploit it because it really matters and um, what the connection's like on the two ends um, before for whether you can use um, that effectively or not. Um, watch out for compression or encryption overheads. Um, between when you're transferring data. So actually, you instead of becoming bound on, say, the um, network performance between the two sites or um, the disk performance at the two ends, you can become bound by the CPU performance because you're spending all your time doing compression and encryption rather than actually transferring the data. And be aware of the weakest link in the transfer chain. So Archer and the RDF are both connected to the Janet Backbone, which is the network backbone that connects all academic institutions um, across the UK. And that's got really high bandwidth, I mean, really high performance. Okay, even from the Archer end, you can get um, 10 gig 
gigabits per second, maybe even up to 20 and more coming. We're hopefully upgrading to 100 gigabits per second sometime in the near future. Whereas if the thing you're transferring to on the other end is your laptop connected over Wi-Fi, then actually the data transfer rate is going to, depend, is going to be limited by the bandwidth of the Wi-Fi connection, not by the connect the R, R trend. So one of the complications of transfer, big complications of transferring data is that um, you have to understand a bit or you have to be aware of the different um, components of the network that might hit you um, along the transfer. OK, I'm going to switch my video off because uh, my um, user is giving me a warning that the, my connection may be degraded due to bandwidth issues. And by turning my video off, um, that should mean that we avoid any problems with audio and sending the slides across. OK, so that's the sort of high level view. and I've got a bit more. Uh, information on each of the sections going through. So um, throughout this webinar, I'm going to have a look at the a brief view of the Archer RDF file systems and their layout. We'll talk about combining files, um, otherwise known as archiving, copying data. So that means copying data from Archer to the RDF, where although there is impl an implicit network transfer, actually because the RDF file systems and the Archer file systems are mounted on the same uh, system, then actually you can use standard copy commands and it uses the internal network at the advanced computing facility up in up here in Edinburgh, which is very fast indeed. So actually it doesn't really feel like you're copying at all, it, like you're going across the network at all. And then we'll talk a bit more about transferring data on off the RDF um, and Archer to a remote site. OK, so um, the Archer and the RDF file system. So hopefully if you're already Archer users or RDF users, you understand a bit about this already, but I just want to recap to make sure we're all talking um, from the same page. Yeah. So on the on Archer, we have two file systems on the um, supercomputer itself. We have Home, which is a backed up NFS file system. So it's available on the login nodes and the serial post processing nodes and the service nodes. You probably are maybe people aren't often aware of the service nodes, but these are the ones that sit between um, running a job and the compute nodes. So when you run a job in the um, batch script, service nodes are the ones that look after launching it onto the compute nodes. Okay, the home file systems available there. Because it's NFS, it's not really a parallel file system in um, the explicit sense anyway. It is pretty standard performance. Okay, so one of the reasons this isn't mounted on the compute nodes is because if people could write to it from the um, compute jobs, what they'd end up doing is slowing down their um, compute performance because the file system was too slow. So to stop people from falling into that trap, the uh, home file system is just not mounted on the compute nodes. Um, and the slash work, which is a parallel luster file system, um, it's available on the login nodes, the serial post-processing nodes, the service nodes, and on the compute nodes. It's the primary file system where data is read and written um, during compute jobs on Archer itself. And one of the key things about work is it's not backed up. The other thing to know about work is because it's a luster parallel file system, it's really, really good at getting good performance for very large um, files. But if you have small files, actually the performance isn't what will be much better than something like NFS. Okay, and that has an impact for data transfer as well as for um, how you organise stuff when you're running your um, HPC jobs. And um, finally, mounted on Archer, there's the RDF file systems, which I'll talk a bit about in a bit more about in the next slide. Um, they're backed up only for disaster proofing, so that's what's called um, DR or disaster recovery. So that means that if you accidentally delete a file there, um, we don't have the facility to restore the file. But if the whole file system um, gets taken out by, say, an asteroid or a rampaging dinosaur, then we can um, restore all the data that was on it from the last snapshot. Okay, so the data is secure, but it doesn't um, help you really with accidental deletion. It's also a parallel file system, a different technology. Um, used to be called GPFS, and people often talk about it that way. I think it's been rebranded to Spectrum Scale um, now. That's available on Archer on the login nodes and on the serial post-processing node, post -processing nodes, but not on the service nodes and not on the compute nodes. Okay, so they're the file systems that are mounted on Archer. The um, RDF file systems, uh, which I already mentioned, were mounted on the login and serial nodes are also available um, on the RDF, on specific nodes on the uh, RDF itself. Um, so accidental deletion 
certainly was covered on, uh, sorry, David has asked a question, says that accidental deletion is not covered on the RDF. Um, it certainly was at one point covered on home. I will have to double check. I think it may be DR on disaster recovery on home on, only at the moment as well. Um, you should assume that for the moment. But what I'll do is I'll update these slides before I upload them uh, with the details of home. I'll double check that uh, for you. Okay, so on the RDF itself, there are the three file systems um, which potentially you might have access to depending on where your pro who funded your project or which remit your project falls under. So there's slash EPSRC for people in the EPSRC remit, obviously slash NERC for people who are in NERC remit, and slash general for everybody else that we don't know how to classify. Okay, the RDF has its own nodes, so it's not just Mountain and Archer, which provides specialized functionality. There are what are called the data transfer nodes or the DTNs, um, and they should be used for transferring data between the RDF and a remote machine, either by logging into the DTNs and pushing to the remote machine or pulling from the DTNs from your um, remote system. The RDF also has a data analytic cluster known as the DAC, um, which is accessible at that address. Uh, that one's useful because although it doesn't have the same wide internet connections as the DTNs, doing pretty standard data transfers off the RDF, it does have um, a batch scheduling system. So if you've got something that needs to run for a long time and you don't want to sit there watching it, or you can't keep the um, connection open for that long, then you can use the um, submission batch submission system to manage tasks in that way. Actually, archiving and compression are often the things that go on here, and then you can use the uh, DTNs to do the transfer once the archiving and compression has happened. Um, and the final thing I should say is that accessing the RDF nodes use your same username and password as you use on Archer itself, and they're part of one integrated user management system. Okay, so that's a quick overview of the different file systems. Um, next sections are about combining files and archiving, which is almost the usually the single most important thing people can do, especially people who have lots of files and directories. So. When I say lots of files, I actually mean lots of directories too here because in Unix, Linux, directories are just special files anyway. Um, so they count in the same way. So um, if you have a very deep directory um, structure, uh, you should combine it into an archive before transferring it. Otherwise you'll see poor performance for reasons uh, we talk about in uh, the latest section. Okay. And one of the reasons, one of the ways we could show, we've got a sh small short example here that shows um, the difference it can make. Okay, so if you're even if you're copying or transferring data, um, moving data about is much more efficient if you for small numbers of large files than it is for large numbers of small files. So we've got an example here of 23 gigs of data, um, split across about 13,000 files. Okay, so if we copy that from um, say the work file system on Archer to um, an RDF file system, general. So assuming we're on like a login node or a post-processing node on Archer itself here, that takes about an hour to copy that amount of data across. Okay, and actually 23 gigabytes of data, that sounds like quite poor performance actually for um, copying across. Okay, if we then, if we combine it into a tar archive, which we'll talk about in a moment as well, and do the same copy, same amount of data, it's just in one file instead of 13,000 files, it takes three minutes rather than the hour. Okay, so there's a huge factor speed up by going from small, large numbers of small files to a small number of large files. And there is some initial overhead here required for the archive creation, right? It takes about 15 minutes to produce the TAR archive, but the time is more than saved on subsequent accesses in terms of both moving the data around, manipulating it, because quite often you might not just want to copy it here, you might want to co copy it across the RDF and then transfer it down to your local um, storage for backup or for, um, for reinflation and then um, analysis locally. Actually manipulating the data and working with the data is much easier um, when there's single files, even in, at the level of listing the directory to understand where, you know, whether the copy you have locally is different from the copy you have on Archer and the RDF. That becomes much easier if you just have one file 
and to check out there. Okay, so in terms of creating the archive, that can take a bit of time, especially for when you've got a lot of files or large amounts of data. You can use the serial queues on Archer or the RDF DAC um, to run these long running archiving tasks if you want. Okay. So what different ways can we, what different tools can we use to archive things, to combine lots of files into smaller numbers of files? So the most common one that people typically use in the Unix Linux where there's something called tar, which we'll talk about. There's also a tool that's less frequently used, but is can be use, more useful than tar in certain circumstances called CPIO. And there's zip, which is uh, come out of the, more out of the Windows world, but also works on uh, Linux, uh, Unix operating systems. There are some technical differences between them and there may be some reasons you choose one over another, for example, um, Zip, you might choose more likely if you're working with people who are working, have use Windows a lot. Um, and we'll talk about some of the other differences going forward. Usually, uh, all of these tools, oh, sorry, both TAR and Zip natively support compression as well. So as your archive, you can compress the data to make it smaller. But usually, um, when you're moving data around like this, unless the data is very, very, very large, um, and you don't just don't have the space to store it in its full size, then you should avoid using the compression actually to speed up the process. But there is a tra trade off if your data is very large, for example, I mentioned you don't have the storage available, or the trans reducing the size of the data through compression can also reduce the uh, transfer time as well. So it's a bit of a judgment call, but, almost, but often you want to go without the compression to speed up the archiving. And process. Okay, so let's have a look at them in uh, the free tools in a bit uh, more detail. Okay, so TAR is um, a ubiquitous tape archive format that was originally that's been in Unix since. Well, it's probably older than me. I'm pretty old now, actually. This command. So the common options that you get to this are around creating new archives, list the files that are processed, and verify the archive after writing. Confirm all hard, hard links from Kuvn the archive and use an archive file. So using all those options together, you get this command, which will create um, a file called mydata.tar that contains everything um, recursively in the mydata directory. Okay, there are a few things do, you can do here to speed things up if, if this is taking too long. One is you can omit the minus V option. Um, that actually doesn't make a huge amount of difference if the tar command is in a batch script, but if you're running it interactively, emitting the minus V, which prints the names of the files as it's um, archiving them, can speed things up quite a lot. But it has the downside that you don't know um, how well, how far you've progressed through the archiving um, so far. So usually people include minus V because they like to keep an idea of where they're going, and actually if the tar process has just stalled and stopped or um, if it's just taking a long time in the files, but it can, you can speed it up, in, especially in the interactive use if you get rid of that, that option. In terms of extracting, use the opposite of minus C, which was create, you can use minus X to extract the data. So we do tar minus XF, my data dot tar. Oh, there you go. David found the original um, date of the tar archive and it came in 1979. So I am just older than um, tar. There you go. So uh, a slightly weird but interesting, maybe interesting to some people aside, is you can often date Unix commands by or Linux commands by how many characters there are in the command itself. So if you have a two-character command like CP or RM, they're some of the oldest commands. Whereas a three-character command like tar is a reasonably old command, and anything that's got more than that is quite recent, really. So you can see that TP, which is the original tape archive program, has less letters than TAR because it's older. Anyway, uh, you can use diff to test um, differences between um, the set of data and uh, the data in your TAR file to see if things have changed, see what's changed, and um, compare it. So that's fine. You can't independently verify TAR archive check for internal consistency in tar archives other than trying to extract them and getting an error if they're corrupt 
because they don't store the files in checksums. So if you're doing the verification, which was the uh, minus W command, W option here um, in the tar creation, then the, all the data that was originally um, pushed into the archive has to be present for that to happen. Okay. Um, one of the benefits of CPIO and ZIP, which we'll look at in a minute, over tar, is they have the ability to be able to do this sort of internal self-consistency test because they can check, store the checksums of the files that get um, archived. Okay, so CPIO is not very widely used at all. You don't see it very often, um, but it can be useful because it has this internal verification option. It has a slightly weird syntax because it takes its data from um, standard in. Um, so here you can see the example command is we find every this find my data means just find every file on my data and then we paste pipe this into cpio um, with the options to create a new archive verbose and use um, a given archive format which uh, crc is the usual recommended one and that will create this recursive um, archive for you and you can extract it in much the same way okay um, there is a way to use CPIO to check the checksums internally, so you can check the internal consistency that nothing's got corrupted um, when you've transferred it from one place to another, which can happen. And it can be a very useful feature, especially for very um, sensitive data sets or data sets that are very important. You often want to check that no corruption has happened to your data because otherwise it might be impossible to tell whether you're analyzing the same data or not going forward. So, um, that's CPIO, less widely used, but it has the ability to check some. Um, Zip uh, came out of Windows. It is essentially an archiving and compression tool built into one, but you can tell it not to compress by using uh, the option minus zero to give the compression level. Um, one thing to note is that it doesn't preserve hard links, so uh, any data that it exists on a hard link is copied into the archive rather than just copying the link into the archive, okay. which is sometimes, which is quite often what you want actually. So it's the right um, choice here in some sense. Um, you can zip, unzip, you can get the data out of the archive using the unzip uh, command. And you can also use unzip to um, test the archive and make sure it's internally consistent because zips store the CRC um, file checksums by default. Okay, so that's um, archiving with the three main tools there. Probably the ones that pe most people use will be tar and zip, depending on circumstances and how critical they, they want um, the internal consistency and verification. Okay, so that's archiving. And I'm gonna talk about copying data. So this is purely in our, in our case here, actually, from Archer to the RDF, okay, or between, essentially between different file systems mounted on the same system. So actually, potentially surprisingly, the best performing way usually to copy data is just the standard um, Unix CP command. So here we're copying something from either home or work on Archer on a um, login node or a post-processing node to the RDF, okay? One thing that's worth noting you should never ever do, though it is possible to do, is use MV here, which is move files. Okay. The reason for that is although they're both mounted on the same um, system, they are different file system and there are file systems and there is a data transfer involved across the wire. And there's a chance that if the data transfer stops or is cut off halfway through, you could lose the data you're transferring. Okay. So you should always copy between the um, source and the destination and if you're doing it to save space check that the data is not corrupt and then remove the original one rather than moving directly okay move is quite a dangerous command where you have multiple file systems on the same system you should only ever use move within a file system and not between file systems so the same is actually true between home and work on archer here as well is that Always copy, check, then remove the original. Never MV, 
So moving within slash n between two directories and slash work is fine. Okay. Because the difference there is there's no data transferred. All it does is update internally in the file system and link it as to where it points to the data, which is a safe operation. Okay. Um, as well as copy, you could use rsync uh, locally. The good thing about rsync is that it doesn't try to transfer files that already exist. So if you're doing some sort of mirroring uh, between different systems, that could save you something if you've already done the first mirror. Uh, the con is it's quite slow. It can be quite slow because there's a large number of checks, met, what are called metadata operations, to check if a file has been modified, if the size has changed, if it's moved from one location to another, and that can slow down the performance. Okay, so what you often find is that first rsync you do is a lot slower than just a bare copy but if you only update small amounts of data after that then the second rsync um, might become faster because it's not transferring as much data um, one often one thing that people often do when they're using rsync because it often says on the internet when i'm using rsync is use minus z which puts compression is Generally, if you're working on Archer or you're copying between file systems, minus Z is not a good idea. All it does is it slows you down because you become bound by um, the compute of the compression rather than the data transfer itself. Okay, and that can be a good thing when you're going across the internet because you actually want to minimize the amount of data you're transferring. But on copying on Archer, the network between the RDF and Archer itself within the building at the Advanced Computing Facility has enough bandwidth that actually using minus Z slows things down rather than speeds things up, okay? Um, and of course, it has to be done on a node where the two file systems are mounted, otherwise it doesn't work. So that's the Archer login nodes and the Archer serial post-processing nodes are the only two places where you can do the, use the local copy trick rather than transferring of data. Um, often the workflow that you'd see on Archer is generate data on the work file system, potentially do some analysis there as well, but then maybe um, archive and move to the RDF before transferring offsite somewhere else is a pretty common workflow. Okay, so that's copying data. Now transferring data, which is probably more interest, or is probably key interest to people here with the upcoming end of service uh, on Archer. So a lot of the same rules apply um, in terms of using archiving to minimize the number of files, um, thinking about whether compression really is helping or slowing you down um, in terms of things. Usually it can, it's worth doing some tests to find out. Okay, so there's a different, couple of different, few different utilities we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about via SSH, which are serial transfers using SCP or if you prefer the FTP protocol, you can use um, SFTP as well. Actually, they use the same thing under the hood. Uh, or rsync over SSH. Um, uh, but for very large transfers, we're going to talk about Globus Online. There is also a tool called BBCP, but I'm not going to cover it in any... I'm really going to cover it in this webinar. There's information in the data management guide on the Archer website if you want to know about BBCP. If you have any questions about it, you can ask the help desk as well if you store um, based on the documentation. Okay, so generally for remote transfers from the RDF, the data transfer nodes should be used. Usually, as I mentioned before, the workflow will be move the data from Archer onto the RDF and then use the DTNs to transfer the data because they have the best network bandwidth to the outside world. Okay, um, so here is an example of copying data to um, the RDF, okay, from some sort of remote source. So in the machine I'm logged into, whatever that happens to be, it could be anywhere in the world, I can SCP recursively the directory called source into my user account on the RDF. And it's the analog of standard MCP, but it has this um, extra syntax where you specified your username, um, the host you're going to, and then a colon, and then the path uh, where you want to put data, okay? rsync is used in exactly the same way and you just need to tell it that you use want to use ssh um, to copy it across okay and you could use rsync can be used as we saw for local transfers but it can also be used for remote transfers where it runs over ssh now i mentioned that you can use the dtns and that's a standard workflow 
You can also transfer data directly off Archer without going via the RDF. You can need, we need to use the serial queues or the post, and post-processing nodes to do this as there's no DTNs available. And um, to get the best performance, you should use the DTNs. But if we're transferring smaller amounts of data, go, data going directly from Archer um, can work can work quite well as well. And one of the challenge, challenges you have is that if you're pushing data, pushing data directly from the Archer login nodes isn't supported. So if you want to, you know, SS, SCP from the Archer login nodes to a remote system, that's not supported. You can do that on the serial, by the serial fields and the PP nodes, or you can do it the other way, where you're logged into your remote system and you push the data into the Archer login nodes. That works, um, but um, going directly from the login nodes and pushing out doesn't work. And you'll find that what happens is your transfer will start up and then it will cut off abruptly um, as it gets killed by the system because we don't allow people to log from Archer login nodes out to remote systems for security reasons. In terms of performance, so one of the things, the S in SSH, or one of the S's, the first one, um, stands for secure. Okay, and that means that all traffic over SSH is encrypted. Now, as we mentioned before, with um, compression, encryption actually costs you in CPU usage. Okay, so what can happen when you're using SCP is that you can become limited by CPU usage rather than disk performance or network performance because it's spending all its time encrypting the messages rather than actually doing the data transfer. Um, one of the ways to mitigate this is to use a very simple is to change the, the encryption algorithm to something very simple that uses less CPU time. And the simplest one um, available in standard um, SSH is something called ARC4, um, which you can specify with the minus C option to um, SCP. Um, and that should speed things uh, up as well. As I've mentioned multiple times before, if you have lots of small files, that also introduces a large overhead. Okay, so you'll get nowhere near the network performance or the disk performance. So ideally combine using an archiving tool before you do your data transfers okay, to get the best performance out of the system. Now, where are we with Globus? Okay, one thing, I'll, before we move on to Globus, one thing I wanted to mention and um, to reiterate was some is when you're transferring data to remote systems, you have to be aware of what, what the transfer, at least a little bit aware of what the transfer path looks like at the two ends. So Archer and the RDF, or particularly the RDF, are connected by wide links, fast links into Janet. Okay? But it may not be the same on the other end. And the things that can slow you down on the remote end is that your local institution, the traffic's going through a firewall, which can slow you down as every packet's checked to see whether it's... Um, valid, whether it's got carrying a virus, whether it's doing something malicious, that can cause real performance issues. Um, if you're transferring to a remote system over Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi has some low bandwidth, okay, so you can't expect to get any real performance. Even if you're going over a wired connection to your local laptop workstation, usually that final bit of wire, the Ethernet connection, is only at one gigabit per second or something like that, and that will limit the transfer time. Um, finally, depending on what your laptop workstation has as its disk as well, you might find that that limits the performance. Okay, so you might be able to stream data off the RDF very quickly because it has a parallel file system, but then when it comes to your disk, local disk, if you have a spinning disk in your laptop workstation, then you'll be limited in the performance. Yeah, even worse than that, if you have an external USB disk, you'll be limited by the bandwidth of USB out to the disk itself. Okay, so the maximum bandwidth you can get in transfer is limited by whatever the minimum bandwidth is along the whole chain, be that disk or network. Uh, right, so for very large transfers between systems that are well connected into Janet, um, Often SCP is not a good way, or rsync is not a good way to get performance, because the single stream with encryption um, slow, just can't um, saturate the network bandwidth, and it takes a long time to, gen to transfer lots of data. The solutions to this are parallel file transfer tools. And what they usually do 
is establish some sort of secure connection to check credentials each end and then open unsecured channels between the two um, sites to transfer the data and they open multiple channels so the data can be transferred in parallel. Now that obviously has a complication overhead as you have to be able to understand which channels transferring which bits of data and stitch it all together at the far end in the right, in the right way. Um, and also the sites have to trust each other because of this unsecured uh, data transfer. So there are a number of different tools that have arisen to do, to do this. The main one is something called um, Globus. Originally, there was a grid FTP tool that you had to set up yourself at both ends and get a certificate for yourself at both ends to make work. There's actually an online client now called Globus Online, um, which manages a lot of the complication for you. So on the plus side, it manages all the complicated stuff for you. So if you have two sites that are already configured as Globus Online endpoints, then you can log into the web and um, say, I want to transfer data from the RDF to my other endpoint, wherever it may be, internationally, elsewhere in the UK, um, and set the transfer going, log off the site, go and have a cup of tea, go to bed, come back the next day, and it's managed the transfer for you. Great. Um, the complication is that both sites have to be set up as endpoints. You can, when you log into Globus Online, set up your own laptop, workstation, whatever you're working on as an endpoint. OK, so you can transfer, use this tool to transfer data from um, the RDF to your local system. And it has some benefits. You would probably won't get the performance from the parallelism um, because, as we just mentioned, your laptop workstation's probably not got a wide connection to the, back into Janet to, to be able to support that. But Globus Online does support um, interrupted transfers. It's a sort of fire and forget, you go away and it sorts out for you. If the transfer gets halted halfway through, it remembers where it is and can restart it at a later date. So it does have those benefits, which might help you out. Um, so you can register for an account of this online. And um, the endpoint for the RDF is um, called Archer RDF or Archer Hash RDF, depending on which interface you're using. Um, you can use your R and use your RDF username and password to activate the endpoint. So the same credentials you'd use to log into the RDF. And then it should just work for you. Um, you can ask you should be able to ask ask your local uh, system administrators if they have um, a facility that's set up as a globus online endpoint to be able to transfer data um, to to local institutions or like i say you can set one up you can using the online tool you can configure one for your local system if you want to do that and you can get very high transfer rates um, using this system okay so if you've got very large amounts of data, and again, remember that um, this won't work as well or won't work very well for lots of small files. What you really want is a very large, small amount of large files um, to make this work efficiently. Um, if you have any problems getting uh, Globus Online working with the RDF, please just send an uh, email into the Archer help desk and we're happy to help you out. Um, so David says, are, there's only, is there only a GUI interface to this? Um, so no, there isn't. So you can, with a bit of work, not for Globus Online, but you can use the underlying technology, which is called Grid FTP, um, to manage your own transfers from the command line, if you want to. It is much more complicated than using the website interface. Okay. Uh, Although there are quite a few people that do it, particularly people who are transferring large amounts of climate data down to the Jasmine facility um, and Rolf Appleton laboratories, they've had that set up for a long time. At least one reason for that is because they're set, they had to do it before Globus Online existed. I'd say if you can use the web interface, Globus Online interface, do it, because the other way is much more complicated and much more of a pain in the neck. Um, if you really want to set up the command line interface using Grid, grid FTP, I would say the best thing to do is to get in touch with us and we can help you with that because it is quite a complicated uh, thing to get running if you've not done it before. Okay, um, so I've already talked about um, the Globus Online performance and the concerns around storage access bandwidth and network bandwidth between the different endpoints and small files. So I've said everything that's on this slide um, already. Okay, so we're at the end now. I've covered everything I want to cover. In summary, um, the RDF's mounted directly on the Archer login nodes and on the serial post-processing node. 
the RDF data transfer nodes or DTNs are available for remote transfers and have the best performance. Um, so you've got lots of data, they're the ones to use if at all possible. Um, archiving, combining lots of files into smaller numbers of files, improves performance both copying and transfer um, and mitigates the problem of la large amounts of metadata operations, which can be a bottleneck when you have lots of small files. Um, beware compression in rsync, it can lead to a bottleneck on CPU performance. That's essentially avoid the minus Z rsync option, which you'll often find in how do I use rsync if you search on the internet. Um, beware encryption in SSH, again, because it can lead to a bottleneck on CPU performance. You can use a, lo a low encryption algorithm such as ARC4, a low overhead encryption algorithm such as ARC4 to try and mitigate this a bit. Um, Globus Online can access the best performance for large data transfers as long as the two ends are configured and is, of course, dependent on the fact that you have high performance disks on both ends and you have high performance data networks between the two endpoints. Um, so be aware of the weakest link in your data transfer train, especially if you're not getting the performance you'd expect to see. Okay, so generally what you'd expect to see is if you've got um, a certain level of network bandwidth, you could probably in practice achieve 50 to 70% of that bandwidth uh, for a real data transfer rather than just um, what it's rated as. So if you have a 10 gigabits per second network, that's roughly eight gigabits per second. So that's roughly um, a byte, eight gigabytes per second. You could probably get about four gigabytes per second with everything working well and parallel transfers and Globus Online and all that sort of stuff going forward. So any questions you have on data transfer, please just contact the help desk. Um, I'm happy to take any questions or any concerns uh, people have about transferring data um, and about the end of the end of service and what we know so far. We are a bit limited in what we can say because it's restricted, but it's been uh, because we have to verify what we can say with um, UKRI. Which, so we have some things we can talk about and other things we're not, we can't talk about at the moment. But I'll do my best to answer any questions people have. And thank you for listening. <laughs> I should get around 50% of peak bandwidth. Do I have the numbers for gigabytes per second over Janet? No, I don't. But actually, Janet's never a problem. Right? The bandwidth of Janet is so huge because it was so it was designed to be uh, very future proof that actually it's the links into Janet that always matter. OK. Um, at the moment at the ACF, I think we have. Um, Sorry, I'm not 100% sure. It's either 20 gigabit per second or 40 gigabit per second, and um, one of those two. Okay. Yeah, so it's almost always a last mile issue. And the problem with that last mile is it depends where in your institution you are. Okay. And so a lot of the places that do a lot of data transfer, for example, um, particularly particle physicists who work with CERN, who get a lot of data from the LH, LHC and these sorts of instruments, or uh, astronomers who work with large remote telescopes. They have special systems that are configured outside of university firewalls to avoid the firewalling issue that can cause real performance problems. And the same is true of Archer and the RDF. They are both outside the University of Edinburgh firewall um, to avoid those sorts of issues. Okay, but um, it depends where you're transferring data to in terms of location and also where the system you're transferring data to sits within that institution. Most most big, so most research universities have some facility now that sits for large data transfers outside their firewall, but you often have to con contact your local um, research computing services to find out where it is and how to access it. Yeah, and as Harvey notes, if you have special files, for example, things that include uh, symbolic links, then you have to be careful which archive command or options you use because you might not actually, one, it depends what you want. Often you want to take the data with you in the archive. So as I mentioned with zip, with hard links, it actually copies the data in rather than just taking, rather than just preserving the link. So 
So that's the right thing to do usually. But sometimes people really don't want to take the data in because say the link points to something very large that's just there for convenience and isn't part of the data set. Then you don't want to take it in. So you have to be, if you've got, if you're using links, you have to be careful about um, what you're doing and understand um, what you want to do and what you don't want to do. Okay, so I can't see any more questions right at the moment. I'm going to hang around for um, another five minutes or so, just in case um, somebody wants to ask anything else. But other than that, thank you very much for attending and listening. I, I hope you found it useful. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this has been recorded. So um, the slides and the recording will be going up on the Archer website as soon as they've been processed. And that'll include, uh, that includes um, information from the chat window as well. So that won't be lost either. Um, and I just want to say thank you again to um, David, who tested the connection. And thank you to Quiven, who um, actually did a lot of the work to update the guide as well.